Hello and welcome to another episode of a weekly waypoint. Today we are playing Halo 1, or more specifically, Halo Combat Evolved, or more specifically, Halo Anniversary Edition, or more specifically, Halo Master Chief Collection. I have a story about this, so um, for those of you who don't already know the lore of Christian's specific interest in Halo, for most of my life, or I guess for most of my teenage life, I, or for the entirety of my teenage life, I remained unable to play Halo. I was a PlayStation kid, I never had an Xbox, I was never gonna, you know, ask for an Xbox for the ability to play one game, uh, and so I never really got to play Halo multiplayer until they brought Master Chief Collection to the PC. Obviously these days I'm an Xbox gamer anyway, but yeah, I wasn't able to play. I, I think I played a little bit of Halo 1 on PC because that was a game that you could have on PC. But for the most part, no Halo. And the main reason I wanted to play Halo wasn't because I thought Halo was a really cool game, uh, or I had friends who played it. It was because I watched the hit web series Red vs Blue. To me, Halo was not a game about Master Chief. It was that game that Red vs Blue took place in. And this week, because Red vs Blue Restoration, the final season, is coming out fairly soon, I've been catching up on Red vs Blue. Uh, and I guess I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but first of all, the, the actual game. When Halo 1 came to Master Chief Collection on PC, uh, and when I was then playing it on Xbox as well, I was disappointed that most people, when queuing for matches, only ever really queued for later Halo games, like... Halo 3, that sounded like a car just crashed, what? Anyway, uh, I've been playing Halo MCC for years, and I've only just caught on to the fact that people don't play Halo 1 in matchmaking but you know where they do play halo 1 in the custom game browser because that's how people used to play halo 1 back in the day we didn't have any of this matchmaking shit like i might not have been a halo player back in the day but i was an unreal tournament player i know how multiplayer used to work you used to look at a list of dedicated servers and choose the one that was doing the game mode or the map that most uh, I guess appealed to you and I'm not gonna lie uh, at the minute Master Chief Collection is not replete with Halo 1 servers there's only a handful and only a percentage of those has a decent player count but having played some match made games of Halo 1 in the past in big team battle and stuff I can safely say this is how Halo 1 was meant to be played this is a far better way of playing Halo 1 it does, you don't do it to like progress your battle pass and like you know do like quick 10 minute matches or whatever and try and do your best and then queue into the next one or whatever you do it in a server and sure these servers might still just be you know 15 minute matches or whatever and then queue into the next map etc but there's something about them which just feels a lot more freeform like you'll notice in these games i play there are tanks lying around and you'd assume the best thing to do is get in a tank right because that they've got the most firepower they're to be fair in halo 1 they're not the hardest things to take out but um, yeah, I notice people don't just go for the tanks all the time because it's boring when there's someone in a tank just driving around blowing everyone up all the time. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it's more about, you know, there's there's more of an element of just mucking around sometimes. I also found some Halo 2 custom games after this as well, which were much the same way. And, you know, with, like, custom game modes with, like, you know, just... I think it's just called Swords is a popular game mode in Halo 2 where you just have a sword and it's all about... Who can click fastest? Doesn't sound very fun when I put it that way, but I had a good time. So yeah, I feel very silly because clearly Halo 1 and 2 gamers don't match make the uh, custom server this shizaz. And uh, I, yeah, I, it reminds me of like, I mean, this is very backwards. I was going to say it reminds me of looking for custom games in Fortnite, but Fortnite's custom games really is what reminds me of dedicated servers in old games like Halo 1 and Unreal Tournament. So yeah, if you ever fancy a few games of Halo 1 multiplayer, um, but you can't really find any matches when you only queue for Halo 1 matches, just check the custom games browser, it's probably all happening over there. Now I mentioned I've been re-watching Red vs Blue, so I'll talk about that. I'm up to Season 7. If that sounds like I'm going really fast to the uninitiated ear, uh, Red vs Blue episodes range from like 3 to 10 minutes long each with like 20 episode seasons, maybe less, maybe more. Uh, so it's not like I'm watching a full TV show worth of 7 seasons. 
also I didn't do all of that in just one week. I have just kind of been doing it the last few weeks and I just haven't been mentioning it in a weekly waypoint yet. Um, but yeah, for those of you who have never watched Red vs. Blue, it is about two armies in the middle of a box canyon. And it's not really like super combat based, they're all just a bunch of idiots, it's a comedy series. And some of the comedy hasn't aged particularly uh, fantastically, it's nothing egregious or awful. Um, but you know, there's certainly some jokes that you made and some words used which probably wouldn't be made nowadays. So if you are going to go and check that out, just go in with that in mind. But the really fascinating thing that I enjoy with Red vs Blue is that for the first five series, it is pretty much just a comedy series. And it's really interesting how they um, work within the boundaries of the fact that they are machinimating inside a video game and they are limited to what they can do inside that video game. But for the most part, it's it's just jokes. It's just funny stuff. There's a storyline, there's plot, don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, it's very comedy oriented. And then the fascinating thing is with season six onwards, they decide to go a little more comedy drama, uh, where it's still got the same old red versus blue hijinks, but there's also like actual lore and like important, or I say important, important to the world, like meaningful storylines taking place and more emotional moments sometimes and things like that and i was saying this on that dreaded hell site twitter the other day i can't think of another show that has made a transition from like pure comedy to like more comedy slash drama i guess like sci-fi like it's its own Obviously it takes place in the Halo game, but it's its own kind of universe. That being said, this is the first time I'm rewatching Red vs Blue having actually played Halo games, like I've played through all the campaigns now, and it is interesting because Red vs Blue, and I'm not a huge Halo lore expert and I know that it couldn't fit into the Halo lore, but like, to the casual observer, it feels like Red vs Blue could fit into the Halo lore. Like, you know, it mostly centers around one military organization and one AI that they've got a hold of, and I won't spoil too much, but like various things that they do with that AI. And while I'm sure that there's a bunch of lore that comes later that I've forgotten about that contradicts Halo lore and all that, um, it is interesting. Also, I know Rooster Teeth uh, would visit Bungie sometimes and had relationships with people who made the game, and I do wonder if the crashed pelican in the Valhalla map was put there specifically so that they could use that in their storytelling for Red vs Blue. Uh, because that is also a plot point. You know, I don't know, I don't, I'm not really saying, like, I don't think they had much influence over the actual games, but it's interesting as well that Halo's marketing sometimes, like, touches on Red vs Blue. It is such a unique relationship. I've never seen, like, you know, a web series be that popular, being inside another universe or telling its story inside another game, and that game also sometimes nodding to that web series and it's just a really interesting thing and I do look at other games sometimes I remember when I was younger I used to think could you make a machinima in Unreal Tournament like could you and now like even now playing Fortnite I'm like Fortnite would be a great freaking video game to make a machinima in the thing is I don't know that there's ever been other machinima outside of Red vs Blue that's really been any good <laughs> I remember enjoying Dude Where's My Mount which was a World of Warcraft machinima comedy series I have no idea how that particular comedy series has aged it was another time etc etc but I am a little sad that we've moved away from this era of experimental like using video games to tell your own story and, you know, if I had more time on my hands, it is something that I would like to explore at some point. But I remember when I was a kid and I used to watch Red vs. Blue, I guess more of a teenager, and I'd be like, oh, wow, you know, this this is so cool. And I'd think, it can't be that hard, right? You just get in the game and you, you bob the heads up and down and you say the words and that's how you make it. But nowadays, I know it's a lot more a lot more effort would go into making that kind of thing like i'm watching red versus blue with a new level of respect of like oh this even in the earliest seasons when it was the most scuffed and the most kind of like sticks and tape production it was still a production and you could see a lot of work went into it and that's why i love re-watching or re-reading or re-experiencing stories sometimes because as you get older you learn more about the world you understand more about how things are made and you can appreciate things sometimes in ways that you didn't before and this is definitely one of those things and I'm really enjoying it I'm probably just going to watch up to season 13 
um, maybe season 14, which I think was like the experimental season where they did a bunch of non-canon short stories within the Red vs. Blue universe. Um, but I'm pretty much just going to watch up to there and not worry about the later stuff because it sounds like the final season isn't going to worry about the later stuff either. Now, a quick follow-up from last week. Last week I talked a lot about strategy games and how I've kind of missed out on that entire genre because of various reasons. You can go watch last week if you're more interested in that topic. So I actually, after I recorded, I booted up Civilization V and decided to give that uh, a go. And how did that go? It went very, very well. Thank you for asking. I know I'm a little bit late to this train, but Civ V is a fucking fantastic game. I've always kind of seen it as a multiplayer game, but no, if you just boot up a single player campaign, you can have a lot of fun just sitting there taking your time thinking about what you're gonna do and what i love most about it is this emergent narrative that um emerges good good words and i've recorded some clips and i don't know if it's gonna make a full video at any point um because i don't know if it tells the narrative properly but i spawned on quite a vertical continent and I was playing as Rome, I still am, I haven't finished this game yet, I've got up to, I've just researched gunpowder, I think? Anyway, um, and this will probably be spoilers for the Civ 5 video because I want to talk about my experiences, but whatever. Um, so I spawned to the north of this vertical continent, and China spawned to the south of me. Um, but it was wide enough to permit me to kind of like march some troops down the middle without going through their borders. And I settled a town to the south of them because I didn't want to get boxed in. And then eventually, after a while, China settled another village or another town or another city or whatever um, a little bit to the west of themselves and completely cut me off from my town to the south, which I kind of thought was doomed anyway because it was near a lot of other foreign powers. So I... Uh, did the sensible thing and I went to war with China and I annexed their entire nation. So now some of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire include the likes of Beijing and Shanghai. And the entire time China were complaining about, uh, you know, me settling near them and me encroaching on their borders and stuff. And it was, I understand why Civ people love playing Civ 5 now. It is such a power fantasy to just be able to be like, shut up entire country. Your stuff is now my stuff. And, uh, you know, obviously, in the real world, war is terrible, but in video games, it's pretty fun. I will say, though, that I have since hit this mid-game lull, uh, where I just have a lot of workers doing menial tasks that I'm having to reassign what they're doing every turn because I've got this glitch, which apparently is only fixed if you buy the expansion packs, which I do not have. And I have a lot of troops remaining stationary at my borders, but, like, there's not much happening politically. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a stale part of the game, and so my interest in it has waned, but I do have that save file for whenever I do feel like... And that's the fun thing about Civ V, I found myself thinking about the game and my strategies within the game outside of the game. I am still interested in learning Age of Empires 2. Um, I do know you can pause real-time strategy games, but right now I am just enjoying Civ V's kind of slower paced. You know, stop and think about things that you will take in this emergent narrative in this randomized world with real uh, countries and stuff, which is really fun. And, you know, like the idea of being Caesar in more of a technologically advanced era and what that's going to look like in terms of troop design, I'm excited to see. Um, and yeah, it's a good time. I know it's a very moddable game as well. I'm excited to see if there's like a Wheel of Time mod so that you can play as like Andor or Kyrian or like these fictitious nations. I'm sure there's a Game of Thrones one. That being said, when it comes to anything Wheel of Time, I am avoiding pretty much everything until I finish that series. I am part way through, probably a quarter of the way through, if not a little bit less, through The Gathering Storm, if anyone's wondering. I have slowed down reading through it now that I've got to Brandon Sanderson's part because uh, that was the part I was most interested to see how he would handle in terms of writing style, and now that I've kind of got a sense of what that is, um, it's not that I'm less interested to keep reading, uh, but I'm less urgent to get to a point to find out about something, if you know what I mean. Also, you know, the pacing isn't quite as good as, you know, Robert Jordan's pacing. <laughs> Bet you thought you'd never hear that. No, Knife of Dreams was a power book, man. But I know Brandon Sanderson uh, finishes that series uh, in a way that the fans really appreciate, and that is no, you know, small order, so... Yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing to read that. That was kind of a segue into a different thing, but sure, let's talk about Wheel of Time. Well, I'm done talking about Wheel of Time, so let's stop talking about 
Wheel of Time. In other news you may have seen yesterday, I put out a video in The Planet Crafter. I have no idea how that video is done because as of the time of recording, it's not even live yet. Um, but it is a bit of a shorter video because I've been saying these last few weeks I've got a problem where I've got loads of clips from loads of different games and none of them are really long enough to make a decently length sized video. But then looking back a few years, 15 minutes did seem to be the average time of my videos. It's just crept upwards. So go check that out if you haven't already. Hopefully it was a fun video. Um, you know, a, a, like a month ago now, I started getting back into checking out survival crafting games. And while I've slowed down a bit on that, um, it's still a thing. You know, I love that I'm back in the Steam ecosystem. I'm surprised that I'm back in a place where I'm booting Steam and seeing a advertisement for a game that's just released and looking at it and going oh cool it's pretty cheap you know what i'm gonna pick that up i thought those days were long behind me but here we are again um and you know i don't think my trends of following stuff like that is indicative of like the general um vibe i just <laughs> okay rephrase that i don't think me leaving steam and coming back is a common trend i think it was just where i was at the time in terms of gaming and it helps that i got a new pc like a couple of years a couple of years ago now no a year ago i'm losing track of time with that i think i'm gonna end this episode of weekly waypoint thank you very much for tuning in especially recently uh weekly waypoint seems to go through phases of getting views and then getting like no views and we're definitely in a lull phase um so hopefully some halo has helped with that anyway i'll see you next week or whatever i make next <laughs>